Welcome everyone. Uh, really good to see some some new and some familiar faces to uh, thinking through photographs. This is our last session of the year. Um, so thank you everybody who's been a part of it. This has been a huge highlight of my fall, what has been a rather frustrating and difficult fall in many ways for everyone. I think this has just given me personally a real sense of um, our photo artist image interested community, a, a way of connecting. And, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been a part of it because it's really meant a lot to me and I, I appreciate your all being here. Um, so tonight again is our last session for the year with, with Zora Murph. Um, before we get to that, just a quick note, we have four sessions in the work for the spring. Uh, they'll start in February and um, just make sure you're subscribed to either uh, the University at Buffalo or Silver Eyes mailing lists and we'll be announcing uh, all those dates and um, facilitators and readings in the next couple of weeks. So that'll be something that's in the works and so we're really looking forward to continuing it. Um, so tonight we have um, something I just wanna say off the bat. Uh, that tonight's topic is violent photographs. Um, so you should anticipate looking at some pretty upsetting uh, and violent imagery. Um, if you, maybe if you come in here and you haven't, you know, if you've done the readings, I think you'll be pretty well prepared for the kinds of photos we'll be looking at tonight, but um, do, do prepare yourselves to see some, um, some pretty traumatic images. Um, and uh, so that, that's the, the trigger warning at the top, uh, if you will. Um, I'm really excited about our facilitator tonight. He's been an artist I've had the pleasure of working with for a couple of projects here and there. And he's currently got some, some really beautiful photographs from his book at no point in between up at Silver Eyes Galleries. Um, uh, Zora uh, J. Murph is a, oh, there he goes. Um, Zora J. Murph, he's assistant professor of art at the University of Arkansas. He received his MFA from the University of Nebraska. He has a, a couple of books um, and most recently his monograph at no point in between was published by Deus Books. Um, uh, a book that I think has a lot of images and ideas and, and um, uh, just construction that really I think made me feel like he was the person I wanted to hear facilitate this discussion because I think he's been someone who's been working been working with these ideas um, that, that are tackled in these articles uh, for many years, I think in, in some of the most um, thoughtful, poetic uh, and, and moving and poignant ways. Um, so to have him uh, with us tonight is a real pleasure. So um, again, if you're, if you're new here, I'll kind of remind you of the format. Um, and also we haven't met for a while, so I'll remind everyone of the format. Um, the facilitator, in this case, Zora will kind of open by presenting a little bit on his work, a little bit on the readings, um, and just sort of share his general thoughts on the topic for about 20 or 30 minutes. And then we'll open it up to the whole group for a discussion. And um, again, we'll use the chat uh, and we'll use the hand raise button and we'll use just kind of unmuting yourself and uh, taking up the microphone um, to talk together. So everyone, you know, as, as usual, it's a big, it's a big Zoom call. <laughs> Um, so be patient and uh, we will do our best to facilitate this discussion. So, um, oh, and he's gone. <laughs> um, Just had to so, turn off okay. my hand. That was enough ado. <laughs> so without any further ado, uh, Zora J. Murph. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, that great introduction, David. And um, thank you to the Thinking Through Photographs team for inviting me out. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and, you know, I've been uh, sort of, I stuck myself in my studio these past two days and have been furiously um, putting together this uh, presentation for tonight. And so I'm just really excited for this discussion. Um, so let me. Pull this up. Okay, can everybody see the slides. Okay, cool. Um, so actually, sorry, hold on. Um, my bad, sorry, wasn't quite prepared yet. Um, I just gotta grab a link really quick. 
Okay. All right. So, um, so yeah. So I'm just gonna just kind of jump right into it. Um, so uh, I'm Zora J. Murph, um, artist, uh, assistant professor of art at the University of Arkansas. Um, this is my, I'm in my third year of teaching. I recently graduated, uh, well, graduated in 2018 um, from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, and then, yeah, came here to Arkansas to teach and continue my research. Um, <clears throat> Um, so um, before we begin, I just would like to dedicate this lecture and line of inquiry to a colleague who recently passed away um, just this, this weekend, um, Dr. Alfonso Walter Grant, endowed assistant professor of art education and affiliate faculty in African and African American studies, political science and gender, stud gender studies. Alfonso had a proven commitment to interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary ways of knowing and representing key issues and aspects of the world grounded in diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-Blackness. Dr. Grant's scholarship expanded many academic disciplines, both utilizing and contributing to theories of Africana studies, Black existentialism, critical pedagogy, critical race theory, curriculum theory, pragmatism, um, queer theory, racial identity politics, semiotics, the brother on the down low, and visual culture studies. His perspectives and scholarship in art education were critical to the destabilization of Eurocentric and heteronormative discourses in the field of art education. I had the extreme pleasure of working with and getting to know Alfonso during my last three years here at the University of Arkansas. Alfonso was a tireless mentor to so many both here in Arkansas and more broadly. Last year, I observed Alfonso while he led a guided tour of the Hank Willis Thomas exhibition at the Crystal Bridges Museum. I watched as he impressively conveyed the many nuances of Willis Thomas works, but more importantly, how he would pinpoint crucial, crucial messages for individual students related to a reading he may have assigned them or a conversation that may, they may have had. The beauty of what he did was simple. He was fully present for people. Though his absence will always be felt, I take solace in the fact that his knowledge, love and care will forever be carried forward by his family, friends, colleagues, students and mentees. We will all miss you dearly, Alfonso. Um, and there's currently um, a GoFundMe for the family. Um, you know, if you, you know, feel so inclined, I would, um, you can follow the link and, and donate um, to support his family. Um, and yeah, it's in the chat. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, so, um, <clears throat> uh, so though the lessons from um, both readings apply to this evening's discussion. Um, I, I placed a lot of emphasis on the third chapter of Seeley's Decolonizing the Camera, Photography and Racial Time, um, specifically part, uh, part one uh, which is of that chapter, which is titled Racial Time. Um, and so as I was doing that, um, there were also like some other publications that, um, you know, like research that I've been doing for my own work um, that uh, sort of qualified or, or helped me better connect ideas. And those are listed here. Um, Intersectionality as Critical Social Theory by Patricia Hill Collins. Um, uh, mainly um, ideas pulled from part three, theorizing intersectionality, um, uh, intersectional experience and community. Um, and then uh, also some ideas pulled from lynching photographs, um, you know, another publication by a publication by Dora Appel and Sean, Mich Sean, Mich Sean Michelle Smith, excuse me. Um, and so um, looking at Dora Appel's um, essay, uh, Lynching Photographs and the Politics of Public Shaming. Um, and so, yeah, it was just like a really sort of, um, it was, I think it was difficult for me to like kind of bring together ideas from all of the readings because the the Sealy was just so full of, um, of a lot of ideas, even just the the short first part of uh, of the third chapter. So, um, 
so Silly begins the third chapter, uh, Violence of the Image, uh, with these two epigraphs from Charles Taylor and Stuart Hall. Uh, they provide an astute introduction to part one, racial time, in their seeming opposition. But what I would argue is, um, I would argue for their confluence. Uh, Taylor posits the perils of the circulation of images of oppression, highlighting how images of oppressive violence can potentially become a vehicle for desensitizing viewers. This desensitization operates um, twofold. It creates apathy or lack of empathy towards those oppressed, and more dangerously, the further normalization of such violence. Um, Seeley's use of Hall's quote as a response uh, to Taylor's, um, while, like it, while it's not directly antagonistic, it illustrates a pathway to remedy those aforementioned ills. Um, and so the potential of archives and um, thinking about images as archived objects provides how one can see past what an image purportedly puts forth, and in that depth, the denial of one fixed meaning or function. Hall suggests that when wading into archives that we have to take one step back and go through the imaginary to enter the domain of culture. And so tonight we'll, we'll take a journey into that imaginary and into the domain of culture. Um, my hope is that along the way, we'll see how critical moments become remembered as images um, and what liberatory politics can be found through critically engaging them. Perhaps more largely, we'll have a better idea of how artists mind lived experience, and as Celie puts it, to ask pertinent questions about photography as an ideological tool. So using a few key points from um, part one as a preface for consideration, uh, we'll be looking at a variety of images to discuss how violence towards system of oppressions, a liberatory type of violence, can be located in attempt to further broaden how and why violence is employed and how it has been recorded and interpreted. Um, and so I won't read through all of these points just for the sake of time, um, but there were just these four key takeaways for me um, that he provides, that Seeley provides in the reading um, that sort of help outline this larger idea of um, how we, look at images and how we think, how we look at violent images um, and sort of the, this, this dichotomy that seems to exist with what, they, what we pull from them and how they function. Um, but the first thing that we need to understand before going, before going on this journey is that race is a construct, that it's an act done onto someone and therefore an existence that one who is racialized has to navigate forcibly until the conditions under which that identity was crafted are abolished. Photography has played a crucial role throughout history in, crafting, in the crafting of racialized identities, as well as in supporting the wholesale belief in so-called racial others. Um, the second point here is um, mainly just outlining that um, when we open up these, these archives, um, you know, that, re, that in some way, um, relate to race, um, that we think about the history and the present simultaneously. Um, and that often when we are looking at black subjects in these archives, um, we're, we're often thinking about the ways in which, um, you know, people have resisted to, in service to progress, but that often those discussions are still framed from a Eurocentric perspective. Um, and so with that Eurocentric perspective comes this desire to forget the perspectives of those who have been oppressed in the first place. Um, uh, the third point, you know, is just this idea that, um, you know, when we use these archives to unsettle their sort of original meanings or intentions, um, the, the knowledge that's produced there is how Seely puts it um, to a burn, equates it to a burning down of the master's house. Um, and so, you know, from that, um, you know, burning, you know, from that burning down, um, you know, there's, there's new meanings that are generated. And so reading images critically allows us to connect the colonial mindset across space and time, 
observing how it creates cultural affirmation of racist attitudes and then sort of the actions that uh, spring forward from those attitudes. Uh, and then lastly, um, you know, Seely uh, states that photography, if we're thinking about photography in that way, then it is a vehicle to assist us in the continuous analysis. Um, the continuous analysis um, of how these critical journeys towards freedom and equality for Black people have been visualized, framed, and represented. However, this can only be accomplished by acknowledging all lived experiences as um, epistemologically valid, more frankly put, interpretations that are not white-centered are epistemologically valid. So when I've been doing lectures um, this past semester, um, I've been starting um, with this quote from Michelle Alexander, um, you know, where she states that, you know, we have to do more work um, to think, you know, more deeply than the broad outlines of history that, we're, that we've often been given. Um, and that, you know, um, that there's, there's a lot of work to be done in that, but that's work only individuals can task themselves with. Um, and so, you know, I think what I'm going to present tonight um, are going to be some, there's going to be some broad outlines of things. Um, and that's not to um, belittle those deeper histories. Um, it's just that I feel like in this work, um, again, we have this personal responsibility to self-educate about the evolution and continued per, um, perpetuation, or sorry, perpetration of anti-Black violence. So, you know, like David said, um, this, uh, this presentation is gonna, um, it does include uh, descriptions of violence, um, images of violence. Um, and so, um, you know, if you find yourself needing to turn away, um, I won't take offense to that, um, uh, but yeah. Um, so we can just kind of jump into it now. So um, I, um, you know, the events from last summer, last spring and summer to today have been not only exhausting, um, but uh, I would also say illuminating. Um, I've had to more deeply evaluate my own relationship to violence and also new ways of interpreting and talking about violence. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, before we can get to these newer ways of thinking, um, you know, I think we, we have to first discuss those things that led me to this conclusion. And so when I was 14, uh, my mother's boyfriend was murdered in our front yard by our neighbor and it was a fight that was provoked by a racial slur. And thinking back on it now, it, it's a familiar moment because at the root of it, there's a desire of white people to police black people. And so when my mom came home from the police station after um, being interrogated uh, about Robert's death, um, she went to the spot where his body fell um, as he was dying. And she just sat there crying, why? And I feel that the answers to her cries exist in history. In 1835, uh, Louisiana enacted the slave patrol statute, which mandated that slave patrols are to arrest any slave or slaves, um, whether with or without a permit, who may be caught in the woods or forest with any flame or torch which slave or slaves thus arrested will be subject to corporal punishment, not exceeding 30 stripes or whip lashes. So in this early legislation, we can see that there was a fear of rebellion and uprising and that these policing practices are founded on systems of injustice, but more importantly, the lack of due process that whites were allowed to in the Bill of Rights. So these patrol, uh, patrols and codes tie together surveillance, the deputization of all white men, specifically as officers, and all white people more broadly as reporters. And finally, the ability to dispense corporal punishment on the scene. 
Slave patrols were some of America's first police forces created with the sole intention of controlling enslaved black people. Surveillance, the deputization of white people, the ability to dispense corporal punishment on the scene. When we consider the violent photograph or image as archived object and ideological tool, the collapsing or flattening of time helps us see more clearly how these modes of oppression are ever evolving as a way to sustain white dominance over black people. Surveillance, the deputization of white people, the ability to dispense corporal punishment on the scene. Um, so this is the lynching of um, an image from the lynching of Reuben Stacy in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1935. Um, he was accused of um, threatening a white woman with a pen knife. Um, and, uh, you know, he was um, uh, just picked up off of the, the street um, because a driver um, passing by as he was walking um, that reported him as suspicious looking. And rather than doing a lineup, um, the police took Stacy to the home of the woman um, who had accused him of threatening her. And the children um, at her home screamed, uh, there he is, identifying, referring to Stacy, identifying him as the perpetrator. So while Stacy was in custody, word spread that he had raped Marion Jones and a mob gathered and lynched him. So Stacy's story is one of many in a long line of spectacle lynchings of black Americans. And photography became immersed in these ritualized murders um, that continued the promotion of, black, of the black individual as an object to be commodified and consumed. Speci spectacle lynching photographs not only existed in the press, but also as postcards often produced and disseminated by photographers, then subsequently collected by audiences as souvenirs for commemorating racially motivated murder. In Dora Pell's lynching photographs and public shaming, she proposes a question that recalls Seeley's mixing of Taylor and Hall's sentiments at the opening of the chapter, a question that highlights how the image vacillates between an object of harm and a tool for liberation. How, as an effect of that widening circulation, did images that initially evoked white pride, affirmation, and entitlement come to elicit outrage instead? and even guilt and shame, polar opposites of the emotions of white supremacists. Um, Ida B. Wells Barnett um, devoted herself to a decades long anti-lynching campaign um, and was an activist, uh, sorry, excuse me, um, devoted herself to a decades long anti-lynching campaign an activist movement devoted to creating necessary pathways for how spectacle lynching can be used to tear down those things they appear to profess. Her work began in 1892 after um, three successful managers of a grocery business were lynched in a black neighborhood just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Wells knew um, all three men and she suspected that the white citizens of Memphis resented these black businessmen because their store successfully competed with a white owned store in the same neighborhood. In response to the lynching of her neighbors, Wells Barnett wrote a hard hitting editorial that criticized the prevailing wisdom about lynching, claiming not only were black men often falsely accused of rape, but that because some white women were attracted to black men, some sexual relations that did occur between black men and white women were consensual. Um, and so, you know, this marks the beginning of, you know, that um, of her, her um, 22 year campaign against lynching um, that took the form of touring, um, touring to speaking events, publishing editorials, uh, preparing pamphlets, organizing community services and participating in women's rights groups. In Patricia Hill Collins's um, Intersectionality as critical, critical Social Theory, she argues uh, Wells Barnett's analyses of lynching illustrates the power of testimonial authority to highlight the point of view of subordinated people. But it also lays a foundation for intersectionality's guiding premises of using race, sexuality, class, and gender as intersecting systems of power to solve social problems. Collins continues that Wells Barnett suggests that the crime of lynching grew less from the individual psyches of, 
individual psyches of individuals in the lynch mob, and more from structural power relations of race, class, nation, gender, and sexuality that legitimated the collective behavior of the mob. So Wells Barnett, uh, early use of what, is, what would be understood today as standpoint theory, uh, which identifies knowledge as a social product developed from a specific social position. Um, and the image on the slide is an excerpt from an anti-lynching organization. And it reads, do not look at the Negro. His earthly problems are ended. Instead, look at the seven white children who gaze at this gruesome spectacle. What psychological havoc is being wrought in the minds of the white children? Into what kinds of citizens will they develop? So by asking the viewer to shift their focus from Reuben Stacy, the victim, to the spectators, the white murderers, this publication is calling for us um, to, as Hall suggests, go through the imaginary to enter the domain of culture. This analysis cannot be possible without prioritizing the lived experiences of those being oppressed. And Seeley, like Ida B. Wells Barnett, Mamie Till Mobley, Alan Sakula, Dora Apple, um, Lee Rayford, and others, recognize that the deeper reading is photography's tipping point from harm to liberation. Um, and so Seeley illustrates this turn well in his assessment of lynching photographs and reminds us once again that the act of spectacle lynching has simply evolved. He states, rather than being history, Lynching photographs remind us that for many African-Americans today, lynching forms part of living memory. Thus, some of the work that lynching photographs do now is to close the gap associated with race hate in the US, which through the archives is often represented as a phenomenon of the country's past. These photographs remind us that living with, to, living with the threat of violence because of one's difference is, a, is real and potentially devastating. And that lynching remains for many, the constant fact of life. This was highlighted by Isabel Wilkerson in her 2014 article for The Guardian. In it, she writes about twice a week or every three or four days, an African-American has been killed by a white police officer in the seven years ending in 2012. This rate of killing black Americans is nearly the same as the rate of lynchings in the early decades of the 20th century. And if we come back to the question posed from the anti-lynching publication, I would argue that this is the result of the psychological havoc being wrought in the minds of those white people who watched those spectacle lynchings. And this is the kind of citizen that terror produces, a white desire to police black individuals as a way to destroy them. Surveillance, the deputization of white people, the ability to dispense corporal punishment on the scene. So this image that's currently on the screen, this was made by students at the school that I teach at. Just think about that. So this line of inquiry is one, again, that I have explored with my own use of images of violence as an artist, but I'm just one artist in a line of many who have done so. And I believe the artists who engage in the politics of violence in their works do so because the formal and aesthetic evaluation necessary to read an image is a ripe space in which to ex expedite social critique. Anna Martine Whitehead's Ferguson Morning in form and title presents a scene reminiscent of a pastoral painting. A crowd of people stand static behind a yellow line, some looking at the ground, but most heads point towards the bottom of the frame past the sagging yellow line to where a pool of digitally pixelated blood stains the pavement. For those who are familiar with this image, we know that Whitehead presents, uh, what Whitehead presents here is a crop of the original, that just below the bottom left edge lies Michael Brown's body in the middle of Canfield Drive. Much in the way that Seeley theorizes the vacillation of the function of an image related to, it, related to its context and its time, Whitehead demonstrates those same ideas through the gesture of cropping. She effortlessly, effortlessly draws us closer to the surreptitious nature of anti-Black violence through her anchoring to the pastoral. Just another Saturday, 
excuse me, just another Saturday morning in Black America. Um, and so these are just some slides of other artists who, um, you know, who work, have worked uh, with similar images and similar concepts. So you have uh, Ken, uh, works of Ken Gonzalez Day. Um, apologies to Ken Gonzalez Day for this poor rendering, but it's the only one I could find online. Um, but where he, um, he digitally removes um, the bodies of individuals who are lynched. And so um, what remains is this sort of ghostly scene that's just, you know, lit with people in it often staring at, you know, this focal point of a tree. Um, but then, you know, of course, the original intent uh, is no longer there. And so having to grapple with uh, those sort of visual cues. Uh, this work by Carrie James Marshall, Heirlooms and Accessories, again, using a lynching photograph um, and then and reinterpreting it or reimagining it. Um, to get at the deeper truths that can exist inside of these violent photographs. So here he's, you know, he's used these necklaces, uh, these pendants um, to, as a way to highlight some faces that are in the crowds, um, you know, but then with the title presents them as heirlooms. Um, and then thinking about, you know, like wearing jewelry as an accessory, this idea of donning something on your neck and hanging, how that relates back to the act of being much, you know, like the, yeah, being lynched. And so, you know, thinking of heirlooms, what are those things that we carry forward from the things that we see? Thinking about accessories, what are those things that we have seen that hang? Um, uh, this work by uh, Dred Scott, a man was lynched by police yesterday. Um, so a sample of um, uh, NAACP anti-lynching flags uh, that they would fly outside of their headquarters um, to signify when somebody had been lynched. And so uh, Dred Scott kind of riffing on that um, and again, kind of bringing those comparisons of spectacle lynching and the police violence that we see today and have seen throughout history um, equating those actions. And again, this is something that I employ in my own work. And so this redirection of gaze uh, can point us at new tools for social critique. Um, by cropping into this image, this lynching photograph, um, we can more clearly think about the fundamental posing that takes place after the act, how some people vie for the best position, the hats and ties that signify members of particular cultural heritage clubs representing their organization front and center. We can also consider that three men in this image were tried and though they solidified their complicity in murder through the photograph that all of them walked free. And so I also began to apply that flattening of time to a flattening of, of photographic context. Um, and that to me started to provide the sense of familiarity. The fact that we've been here and seen these images before and we'll be there again looking. So Celie concludes part one um, by confirming that this journey we've just taken is one in racial time, a phenomenon he describes as time that does not tick along in a fashion that produces seconds, minutes, hours, and days. It works more like a cultural pulse in which the political conditions around it cause it to quicken or slow down. Such a journey across time to form to a form of justice for those black people executed for white pleasure is an example of racial time and operation. Racial time is exhausting for those whose lives have been historically managed and framed through the images and ideas of race, not because they are warned by seeing images of violence against the other, but because they are the other, so familiar with being framed in a violent totalitarian Eurocentric gaze. This violence, whether or not it exists, uh, whether or not images of it exist, expands well beyond physical harm. So much like Seeley's assessment of racial time operating on a spectrum of speed, so does violence. What is the difference between a spectacle lynching, a police murder, the redlining of a neighborhood, to me, it all sounds like the systemic eradication of a people, sometimes experienced quickly, sometimes slowly. 
And so I'm often asked how I deal with these violent images. How do I create space to attend to my mental health? And honestly, I feel like preparing for this discussion has finally provided me clarity towards an answer. And one that is my own experience of racial time from the moment I decided to watch the murder of Laquan McDonald unfold on screen. To the spring and summer of 2020, to today. A crucial experience within that came from a conversation, um, so sorry, excuse me. A crucial experience that um, came within that experience um, was a conversation I, I had with my friend, Terrence Washington. And so he was um, telling me that when considering images of violence, political ideology and court of public opinion, that we must remain vigilant to the fact that at the end of the day, somebody's dead. That these are real lives that we're talking about and debating over. And so in my journey of racial time, uh, my way stations of support are other artists, professors, and friends, those people that I can commiserate with, spill some tea with, chop it up with. It's in these kindred moments that I find growth in my ideas of how to speak about race images and violence. This image made by uh, Danielle Bowman was taken for the New York Times, Mag New York Times Magazine 1619 project. This is the point where in late August, 1619, 20 to 30 enslaved Africans um, landed at Point Comfort. These enslaved individuals are the first recorded Africans to arrive in England's mainland um, colonies and thus the beginnings of race-based enslavement. Looking at these dark waters, it's easy to center the circumstances of those enslaved people. But what I appreciate about this work is that 400 years later, a black photographer is creating images to remind us of the inception of racial, racial oppression in America as a means to address the conditions of anti-blackness today. Bowman's work for the 1619 Project very much shows us the past injustices we've survived. And Dion Lee's work helps us consider finding those skills necessary for self-sufficiency and survival. Through gestures, she says, are an act of claim or an insertion of agency into the current and historical narrative surrounding the landscape. In North, light shines on dark arms and hands raised in an act of orienting or navigating. My graduate student, Tay Butler, told me the other day, ours is a history of movement. And I think about all of those black eyes that looked into dark skies North with hope. Though North was a geographic location, it is also an ideological destination. These considerations lead me to think about those who have risked their lives, risked their own lives to liberate others to that geographic and ideologic North. In a recent interview for the podcast, Who We Are, Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson, assistant professor of history at Wellesley College says about Harriet Tubman, when it comes to the abolition movement, we have these very romantic stories that we tell ourselves about the Underground Railroad and people sort of running away as though running away was very easy to do or as though running away did not require violence or force. That when people stole themselves away because black people were considered property, it was a dangerous endeavor and that people armed themselves and did everything they could to flee. And when we think about Harriet Tubman, Oftentimes, we don't think about the fact that she's strapped. And so in her sentiments, Dr. Carter qualifies Harriet Tubman's many acts of liberating as acts of violence, a type of violence that is done to an oppressive system. And it's here where I feel my own eyes turning towards that ideological north, seeking out those moments and images that speak past the violence done onto us. We have not only survived atrocity, we have always rebelled and committed acts of violence against those individuals and systems that seek to destroy us. This is a photograph made by my good friend, Jay Simple, and Jay's in the house with us tonight. Hi, Jay. Um, and it incorporates metaphorical thinking uh, to prepare us um, for the journey that we're about, that we're going to embark on in seeking out liberation. 
What are those things necessary to survive? What are those old ways of thinking that we may hold on to? Are we properly armed and ready to commit the necessary violence to get to liberation? And where are we headed? Anyway, um, so, you know, this quote, this is actually me quoting myself, fuck 12 is a liberatory statement. Um, and so fuck 12 is a phrase that is, uh, that's been popularized by black individuals um, as an anti-police slogan. Um, 12 is a slang term for police or any law enforcement officials. Um, it came from the police radio code 1012. Um, also um, refers to the show Adam 12, um, a show about two police officers um, on the LAPD police force. Um, and so we also, to, like today, we know this term's connection to the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, as it was used as a protest cry, um, you know, in these acts of revolution um, that we've been seeing. And so I bring the term fuck 12 into this space and into my practice because to possess the ability to speak about liberation, we need to understand the language of it. Fuck 12 is a statement used by those who seek to abolish things that oppress us. A liberatory statement acknowledging that the destruction of my oppression contributes to the freedom of all. Um, and so we're gonna look at um, some, these are the images that I um, sort of brought in for our contemplation this evening, um, thinking about, um, you know, sort of uh, Seely's ruminations on the functions of images, of violent images, and, um, you know, me sort of trying to work towards a way of, um, you know, talking about different types of violence. Um, and how those things appear, how we interpret them. Um, and so again, sorry that there's no sound. Um, and so this is um, Arthur Jaffa's uh, Love is the Message and the Message is Death. Um, and so if you were able to hear the sound, it's like a bunch of different types of video clips. Um, and then the track playing over is uh, Kanye West's Ultralight Beam. Um, but I, I wanted to start with this work um, because I was recently doing a visiting artist thing with a colleague of mine, Kevi uh, Handley Byrne, um, and they were talking about um, Arthur Jaffa's work and they were talk they had mentioned how they had heard from a professor um, that Jaffa stated, my work is for black people. And so I was really, like kind of affected by that statement. And then especially when thinking about this work um, and you know that statement itself seems sort of violent when we think about the interpretation of art and how often those, those knowledges and, and theories that get applied in interpreting artworks are ones based in whiteness. And so for an artist to center blackness is, is a sort of violence onto that act. Um, Further, you know, to me, um, you know, as I as I watch this this artwork, I feel shame, I feel joy, I feel terror, I feel happiness, but I'm also physically affected by the music, and I I, I move, and you know, I I feel myself breathing, and so through that, I know that I am alive, and sometimes being alive means feeling pain. Um, but more specifically from the work is like this, I chose this image specifically to talk about, um, and it's of Martin Luther King Jr. on a bus sleeping, um, but thinking about the rest and self-care necessary to prepare for revolutionary works. Um, the second image I wanted to bring in to, for consideration um, was this video clip from um, when Kanye West spoke, up, spoke out about the racial inequities um, of a hurricane relief response um, during Hurricane Katrina. Um, but, you know, this, this moment where he decided to use his platform to express his outrage, um, you know, to talk about racial inequity publicly at a time when it, you know, wasn't necessarily something that happened very often, um, you know, out in the open and on such a large platform. Um, and so, you know, after his statements, you know, we all had to watch 
and work through the lack of response through the media shaming of black people uh, and the Danziger Bridge shootings. Um, but that, you know, that uh, Kanye West, you know, was like sort of firebranded as, um, I can't remember what George Bush called him, um, like a jackass or something, I don't know, anyway. Um, but that made, that made me think about this Harmony Holiday um, quote that I read recently from um, uh, her book, The Black Catatonic Scream, uh, which states, imagine being placed at the mercy of machines as punishment for the fearless grace in your perfect black heart. Imagine not understanding or forcibly forgetting for a moment that you live in occupied territory in a society where unchecked, ter unchecked tenderness or indiscriminate concern for your community can get you committed for the can get you committed the wrong kind of asylum. Imagine forgetting that you're black and one afternoon singing the blues out in the open, hoping that someone will respond, waiting to hear the talking drum of another undone homeland. Um, and so just how these words sort of apply, you know, to that moment, but then how also, um, how we as artists, sometimes seek to be that drum beat that Harmony Holiday speaks of. Um, so this is uh, There Are Black People in the Future um, by Alicia B. Wormsley. Um, and um, yeah, this work that was inspired, um, um, uh, so I'm reading from, from uh, Alicia's website. So, um, There Are Black People in the Future is inspired by Afrofuturist artists and writers who highlight the need for black people to claim their place. Through the inscription and utterance of the words, there are black people in the future, the project addresses systemic oppression of black communities through space and time by reassuring the presence of black bodies. In 2017, Wormsley placed these words on a billboard in East Liberty, a neighborhood in Pittsburgh's East End that has suffered gentrification. When the billboard was removed by the city, uh, community members protested in response to this community support. Uh, Wormsley has raised grant money to, um, to artists, activists, and community workers in Pittsburgh and Houston um, around their interpretation of the phrase, there are black people in the future. Since then, the billboard has been replicated in Detroit, Charlotte, New York, Kansas City, Houston, and London. The text which Wormsley encourages others to use freely has since been used in protest, critical art theory es um, essays, song, testimony, and collective dreaming. Um, and so words from the artist, uh, it started out as a black nerd sci-fi joke, a response to the absence of non-white faces in science fiction films and TV. Very much a response to many Afrofuturist writings like Florence Oyeke's, um, after all, to quote musician Gabriel Te Teodoros, if we don't write ourselves into the future, we get written out of tomorrow as well. Afrofuturism dares to suggest that not only will Black people exist in the future, but that we will be makers and shapers of it too. This phrase became my mantra. Um, and so just um, a few other images pulled from Alicia's website. Um, and so the last image for um, for consideration for the discussion I chose um, uh, is uh, E.J. Hills. Uh, my Latin is horrible, so um, someone correct me if I'm wrong. Ele ex excellentia militia victoria. Um, and so um, uh, I'm reading some writing about this work um, that was done by the LA Times columnist, uh, Carolina A. Miranda. Um, his piece titled Excellentia Militia Victoria which translates to excellence, resilience, victory in Latin, was part of the Hammer's 28, Hammer Museum's 2018 Made in LA Biennial. Um, in it, uh, Hill uses symbols of sport to ruminate on the nature of sacrifice, competition, and achievement. A track circled the room and astroturf carpeted the floor. To one side stood an impossibly tall wooden hurdle. Around the gallery, like Stations of the Cross, were stark photographs of Hill running victory laps around the schools he once attended. St. Michael's Elementary in South Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles West High School in Torrance, and El Camino College, also in Torrance. 
At its core, the work is about Hill re-examining the places that have shaped him and reckoning with their significance to his life. He began by running around the various schools he had attended in Los Angeles, actions elegantly recorded by photographer Texas Isaiah. On each lap around the block um, that each campus is on, um, I would really think about who that teacher was at the time and what that meant in my life, Hill says. There were some laps that were really difficult. The actions acknowledged education as empowerment, but also as something to be overcome of the ways in which African-Americans are welcomed and not into US institutions. In this case, an educational system that claims to aspire to diversity, even as it writes black history out of the textbooks. Where on earth in which soils and under what conditions will, <clears throat> will we bloom brilliantly and violently? This isn't our game. We're in this thing that wasn't designed for us. It still grinds on us. It's hard being black, black, brown, and queer. It's hard to be alive in spaces that are designed to kill you. But there I am, standing. Um, and so again, just to kind of look through the images. Um, so we have uh, this one from Arthur Jaffa's Love is the Message, The Message is Death. Um, Kanye West speaking out about racial inequities during um, Hurricane Relief uh, Telethon. Um, there are Black People in the Future uh, by Alicia B. Wormsley and Excellentia Militia Victoria by E.J. Hill. Um, but yeah, that kind of concludes my piece. And so I guess we're ready to open it up for discussion. Um, Zora, just uh, thank you so much for that really uh, brilliant, brilliant lecture. I, I think it was just a, a amazing summation of so many different ideas and a really wonderful um, insight into your practice. So um, I think I think I speak on on behalf of probably all of us here. Just just thank you for for that. That was really really brilliant. Um, so I, I think the format here now. Um, you know, is, is really open to to all to, to contribute a thought in the um, in the chat, or just to kind of raise your hand um, and you know have a response or or a question, or you know to to Zora's lectures or to one of the readings, or or however um, however you want to um, begin. Um, Uh, and, and maybe while you're all gathering your thoughts, um, one of the, the things I think that I'll uh, just start with um, that really struck me, because um, I know we, we saw this lecture, or Zora and I talked about this lecture last week, and, and it's been expanded a great deal over the weekend. That was quite a weekend of work you, you put in. It's really, um, really amazing. Um, you know, I think that, uh, and I'll just ask this as a question to you, Zora. Um, the thing that really stuck with me is that image of, of Dr. King sleeping on the bus um, as a really like uh, very incredibly moving, you know, image of repose and, and so natural. And, and I think, you know, one of those things that I think about photography all the time is like the sort of the great person photograph and, and to, you know, see a photograph and like imagine all the shit people were shouldering through their kind of moment in history. Um, and, and so you mentioned, you know, that, that self-care um, has become an important, becoming increasingly important to your work and your practice. And I was just wondering if you could share with us, like, what have, have you been able to do self-care for yourself? Like, I, I know people are, you know, myself included, and I, I sort of feel um, like I'm part of the problem in this. A lot of people are asking you to, like, explain this moment for us or to us. Um, and that a lot has been has put in, been asked of you and put on you. So, you know, have you been able to to find your moments of rest and repose? And and if so, what what's been been what have they been? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know, it's it's been increasingly hard, uh, you know, with with the pandemic to find those moments. Um, and so, I think it's just trying to find, like for me at least, just trying to. Um, I think, well, I, I guess like for like 
first of all, I guess one thing that I that I should say is like when when dealing with these violent images and thinking about these violent images, um, you know, I have a background in psychology, you know, I know how to, like, I've been sort of trained in how to do objective scientific research. And so there's like this sort of like, not that like my research is in any way like completely separated from me as an artist, but I have this sort of like kind of objective research brain that I can, I know how to turn on and off, um, like when I need to. And so, you know, like dealing with this stuff, it is very difficult, you know, to see, but I also understand, um, you know, much like Mark Seeley and like these other names that I've mentioned, like understand that it's important to, to talk about these types of images, why and how they exist, the things that we can garner from them. Um, and, and so I think I, I sort of understand the importance of that. And so I, I kind of go into it, the, into it with that spirit. Um, but I think lately for me, it's just been trying to find ways to draw very clear boundaries around the things that I do because, you know, like I'm, I'm, you know, basically like I, fortunately I have a job that accommodates me being able to work from home safely. Um, but in everything happening, you know, I'm in my studio, which is also my classroom now, um, which is also in my home it's become really hard to sort of draw boundaries, like very clear boundaries between things. I think it was like maybe the, the third or fourth day, um, my, my wife does the exact same stuff I do in, in the same house. Um, but, um, you know, like, I think it was um, like our third, like 16 hour day. And we were just kind of looked at each other and like, we gotta stop this. Like we can't, we can't keep up at this pace. But it's, I think it's harder for us to shut it off because those boundaries have started to disappear and sort of melt together. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, sort of self-care today um, in the now for me is, has been trying to draw really clear boundaries between, you know, my home life and my, my artist life and my professor life and, you know, all of those other roles um, that, that I currently have. Can I um, make an observation about the, uh, the images that you chose as uh, discussion points as a way to open it up to other people? Mm -hmm. I know yeah. um, many of us are uh, joining us from Pittsburgh. So um, there are many people who are intimately familiar with um, Alicia's uh, work, but I find it very interesting. This is a curatorial observation on the selection of a group of artists and images that none of the um, selection that you made are, um, the, none of them are easy in their, or comfortable in their representation of a larger project. So uh, the still image from uh, a moving image piece um, that is a compilation of so many different um, slices of uh, black life um, and uh, Kanye commenting on uh, really like a larger structural um, system uh, and Alicia's work of, of course is uh, something that kind of um, is a surfacing of uh, what lays underneath in terms of the dynamics of uh, race, class, uh, politics in Pittsburgh and elsewhere in the US um, and uh, EJ Hill's work being uh, a, an immersive experience that kind of is rooted in, in uh, the space of the exhibition, but far exceeds um, the, the uh, presentation space to um, uh, the similar kinds of social spaces that um, he has had to navigate. So um, thinking through all of these images that you have brought to uh, our discussion and the topic, which is violence, of images, I'm thinking about like um, the cut that you are making, uh, the selection in itself as um, a, a perhaps an act that must necessarily be violent in the same way that you are kind of taking the notion of violence um, and uh, kind of really turning it around and saying, you know, um, people who had to flee, um, uh, enslavement, um, well, they, there had to be an act of violence in there, right? Um, so uh, I wanted to kind of 
um, think about what violence means in each of these um, photos. And um, I really encourage all of the people, especially um, people who are familiar with, um, well, we're all familiar uh, with, you know, um, all, a lot of the topics and subjects that you've brought up, but, um, you know, we're, we're uh, among friends. So I encourage all of you to, uh, to um, kind of chime in with your observations and thoughts about violence in these images that do not necessarily seem violent on the surface. Can we actually put them back on the screen to go through them? Because I feel like- Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, let me uh, get that. OK, um, so yeah, it was uh, uh, the EJ Hill work. Um, oh, wait, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, Okay, so the Jaffa, um, Kanye, Alicia B. Wormsley, and E.J. Hill. I mean, I uh, random. Thought. I mean, I, I go back to that Kanye West video as like thinking about that as like an act of violence. Cause like, it was really interesting if you like look at his face when they came back from that, like uh, after the commercial break, I just remember, I, I haven't even seen it in a minute. I can still kind of remember it. Um, you can see that like, that like he's kind of going through like this, his own like internal battle, like conversation with himself before like saying something. And you can even see in like the shake of his voice when he begins to speak and it's like very short, right? But it's like, you can see that he's under like, a unsurmountable amount of pressure and stress to even just say this very simple thing, right? And so it becomes like, right, like his necessity to even be able to speak out about this becomes like this form of, of violence that's being like enacted upon him and like all these other people who need these resources, it seems. I mean, I think there's also something really violent about watching this on mute. It totally changes how we're seeing it. I mean, the fact that like, if we were gonna critique this as an image, we're viewing a white man next to a black man with something that says 1-800-HELP-NOW in like the kind of tone that we see these commercials where it's like, help someone that needs your help. And you know, in the West and like through Eurocentric lens, we've always seen black and brown bodies as the individuals that need help. So I think it's actually shifting the violence significantly when we view it without sound and we could, you know, wonder what's being said by who and who needs the help versus who is being helped. And yeah, I didn't like, even think, oh, go. I was just saying like watching the video in the background behind them, like really also like without sound, we have like no context about what's actually happening there too. So I'm just like, whoa, like what are all of the associations that we have with like aerial scenes of helicopters? Like, is this a cops like, you know, episode? Like, is this like a Hollywood thing or are we watching like actual like news or documentary footage? Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, I hadn't even really thought about it in the absence of sound because I've just been watching it with sound. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, you may have just, you know, solved a new artwork for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, sorry. I think that like sort of how you're talking, it, how you're sort of reading it with the absence of sound. I feel like when I was like putting this together and thinking about these images, because this was something I watched live, like as it was happening as a teenager. And just thinking like, what, like what just happened, you know? And like, that wasn't supposed to happen, right? Um, and, but then thinking about like, like sort of the thoughts that moment kind of stirred up. But I, I think it's those, it's like kind of ties back to that idea that I, um, you know, was, was sort of getting at with the Sealy is, is that, um, you know, you have to enter this realm of imagination, but we already do that with, like very like charged cultural moments that we view, right? If we all think back to 9-11, you know, like what are those things that we think of? For me, I, I, it's like, you know, what, remembering the, the, the teacher roll a card in and then we just sat and watched as like buildings were burning, right? 
Um, and, and, but that's like a mental image and it places me in a specific time and context. And then, you know, like it exists like a photograph itself. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that there and stop talking so that people can speak. I remember um, with the Kanye piece as well, watching that um, living in the States and being Canadian and watching Mike Myers response um, or lack thereof and reflecting on the quintessential Canadian response to when things happen south of the border, um, how far removed uh, we'd like to think we are from these issues, but they're very much um, in bed in everything that's happening here. I'm, I'm speaking from, uh, I'm in Toronto. Um, so yeah, that's just another thing that I was reflecting on when I saw this piece. I think another thing that I'm kind of seeing between all of these images are the historic gestures that, you know, the Eurocentric lens and photography as a medium has presented bodies in. And these are roles that are always dominated by white bodies. And now we're seeing a black body occupying those spaces. And so that could be violent for some people, um, but powerful for others. Um, also the image of Dr. King, like he could be peaceful or asleep, but like it's 2020 and like this shit's been happening for a long while, but like he also could be dead. So I think that kind of moment for me as well is like, how do we read emotion? How do we read gesture? And how are we trained to read specific bodies performing specific gestures and how has society conditioned us to do so? Um, one thing I was thinking uh, about the Alicia Wormsley piece, um, when that happened to, to, to lend some context to it, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the, the context that you read isn't quite right. It wasn't the city that had the um, billboard taken down. It was a, a private landlord um, who owns the building, who, who sort of let, the, let various artists use the billboard for kind of artistic cryptic messages. So that, that billboard in Pittsburgh had just a, you know, I think every month or two it would change, a different artist would be allowed to put a message on. Um, but I remember the, the landlord said that she felt like the message had to be taken down because she thought it was a threat. Um, and the message was threatening and, and she sort of uh, said that, you know, the community members in this rapidly gentrifying neighborhood at, at that time, you know, were, were calling her and saying they didn't feel safe with that billboard up. Um, uh, and, you know, I don't, probably doesn't need to be said, it's a, it's a white landlord and a lot of new white neighbors in the neighborhood. Um, so then, you know, that, that, them, them feeling, um, you know, threatened by a message that is so, you know, like, like talking to Alicia about it, she sort of described it as this, like, as a joke, like it literally just started out as like a, a silly, like it was sort of born in, in kind of silliness, um, but was so like scary to, people in this neighborhood. I want to lend a little more specificity to what you, the situation that you described, David, and others feel free to jump in. Um, it was actually, this billboard site was actually um, uh, rented out by a single artist in Pittsburgh by the name of John Rubin. And he invited other artists to come and do whatever. And the legal premise under which the landlord was able to take this down is um, John uh, signed an agreement saying that he would run by, like the message had to be approved by the landlord. Um, and uh, the first message was, but um, admittedly, uh, subsequent um, artist iterations were not run by the landlord. And when this appeared, that is when the landlord decided to um, take action. Um, and I think that really, uh, in some, in many ways, go, goes back to what Zora was saying in terms of um, violence and who enacts this violence. Um, because, you know, the, the landlord um, is legally entitled to do this. When does that person choose to um, fall back on that uh, authority? And, you know, um, we're thinking about uh, violence as something that is 
you know, um, in just common usage, uh, negative, but um, there's certain types of violence that is sanctioned uh, legally. Um, and so thinking about uh, the, the monopoly of violence um, that is sanctioned by the state, uh, I, it makes it, you know, it's a kind of a, an interesting legal parallel here of um, exercising certain rights and the implications that it has. Um, if, if I may jump in, I, um, Zora, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I, I was quite interested in the uh, point you brought up early on about that, uh, the tipping point of, of, between viol uh, was it between violence and liberation. Um, and I've been trying to think about how uh, context and circulation play a role in in some of the work that you've shown. And I wanted to ask if you could speak about how you think about uh, context in, in 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 your own work. But like, for instance, you know, here obviously it's you know the the uh, kind of commercial context of the billboard and and the billboard is being repurposed um, in the case of the photographs of lynchings you know there's a uh, you alluded to the whole history of their circulation as postcards and then if I'm not mistaken is the work of Kenneth Gonzalez day doesn't he make uh, billboards also from the the images that that where where the figure is re removed, but then I was also noted that you have, and I'm sorry that that's happening at your university. That you had was it a Facebook post? You know that the response to George Floyd, but it but it's all like it, it seems that a lot of this has to do like a lot of the kind of the interpret the the role that's being played by the image and the interpret you know the meaning of the image. Uh, has and and even like you know, with someone just mentioned, we're among friends. Like this is a particular uh, like con kind of context in which you have a certain kind of discussion. Like what you know, what what happens outside of this kind of context? Uh, um, you know, um, yeah. Anyway, so um, how how do you think that, especially like in all the kind of you know, like the media landscape that that we're inhabiting now? Um, and, and like, you know, how, the, how, where your work uh, crosses into it, how, how do you see that? Um, well, when I think about context, I, I suppose, um, I think it's, it's under, maybe, maybe the way that I use context is to try to wake up viewers to the fact that like images can be contextualized to the extent that you want to try to contextualize them which means that you can draw meaning from images and like that you can, you can create context with images. Um, <clears throat> and so like, you know, like all of, you know, this, like the research that I'm referring to, it's, it's just, it's speaking to the potential or the possibility of images. Um, and so I suppose that like context is important because within context, like, like you can generate new meaning or new sight. And so, you know, like if we think about the lynching photographs and like, like why they existed, um, they, were, they were made as objects to be consumed and then became understood as objects to, um, to as a way to shame black people and remind them of like their existence in this country, like where they exist on this sort of social hierarchy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I think about context is just like how, how we can use it to, um, to develop our own understanding, I suppose. Um, and then, yeah, you had a lot of other questions, but I think that like, uh, yeah, yeah, context, um, context is important. But it's not that like, yeah, anybody can can create, you know, like all like their own sort of image context, whatever you want to call it. Um, but that again, like it's it's something that we as viewers should understand is like it's available for us to do for like as a as a way to think critically, um, you know, about whatever, right? 
Um, I think that's, yeah, like how I use it as an artist, how I think about it when I'm researching, um, all of those things. I wanna touch on that because um, I, I'm not familiar with this work. And when it came up on the screen, the first thing I thought about was a conversation I had years ago with friends about watching horror films and the trope of black people being the first ones to get murdered. And my thought was back then, I'm like, you know, we were just thinking like, why, why is that? Why is it? And, and what came to mind was, oh, the future is not for us or their future and thinking of the, the future existence where the, you know, kill off black people because there's no imagination of um, at the happy ending that, that we would be there. Um, and so in hearing and filling in more the context of it, um, it still it still applies um, to that idea and also in terms of the subtle violence of the statement um, and, and my associate association with it with horror tropes um, and also with EJ Hill's work, which I, I actually do find heartbreaking as someone who's from Los Angeles and know when you rat rattle off the names of those schools, I knew where he was. And I, it, it just kind of broke my heart um, because in terms of thinking of the subtle violence of being in predominantly um, non-Black spaces, I, I would say that in those, in those areas, it's not all white, it's mostly white and Asian um, of, of all um, nationalities in, in, in those neighborhoods, but um, sort of filling in my experience around that and thinking of my own experience of trying to um, protect myself from, from uh, uh, what, I, what I knew would, would be a violent high school experience in my neighborhood um, and trying to get out and go to another education experience where I would be safe and thinking of what would it be like to be put in, into a situation or we think about education um, uh, in, in this context of, of, of Hill's work where others might think you're doing something that is progressive or wrapped up in progress, but still that act um, is traumatic and it is, it is violent to your psyche in ways that manifest in this really wonderful work. And so, and also thinking about rest, um, the, the photograph of Martin Luther King um, sleeping uh, conjured up this, I, you know, I just learned about the Mennonite house in Atlanta um, that was run by, uh, I think it's Rosemary and Vincent Harding, where the, the most well-known figures of the civil rights movement would go to that house to rest, to hang out and just be and regenerate and rejuvenate and sort of, again, putting yourself in these situations of progress because it is necessary, but also traumatic and also violent. Um, so yeah. Yeah. That's well put. I mean, yeah, I I hear you wholeheartedly. Uh, thank you for sharing. Does Jess uh, want to add anything? Because um, it seems like uh, there was a comment about E.J. Hill's uh, work and the performance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a lot, but just uh, been thinking about that performance. Um, I know that it was a really arduous, intense, um, endurance piece for him. And, and I remember, I think he spoke at UIC once um, and was talking about um, that it was just physically like really, really destructive for him. Uh, and that he had to recover for several months from doing that. Um, I just, I don't know, it's just a, it's a wild extra facet to the performance to be talking about sort of suffering and oppression and then to like put yourself through so much suffering in the process. Right. Well, I think, you know, like one of the ways that, that I think about it is um, that, yeah, like that performance, you know, it, it like, do, like it did take a very large physical toll on him. But then, you know, like maybe we can use that as a way to talk about, you know, like, like how Celie talks about racial time or experience of being racialized. And that every day it's like wearing, it's grinding, you know. Um, in a lot of ways, it's like, it's almost like fucked up because being stuck at home has actually like alleviated a lot of like mental health symptoms that I like, I, you know, like a lot of issues I was having mentally of having to go to, you know, the, the university campus every day. Cause it was like, as soon as I knew I walked 
into that building, it was just going to be an onslaught of constant bullshit. And then how, how wearing that is, right? And that, yeah, like we can talk about, I mean, I, I think it's, it's just a, a good way in to talk about like actual lived experience, um, you know, and um, yeah, but I, I think that, you know, again, this, this idea of, of, of persisting through that, um, you know, like that, that endurance, that, that enduring, you know, that, that again, um, you know, it's, it's enacting the violence against the oppressive system itself. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think something interesting with these images, especially, and kind of what you just said is like, a response to violence is almost always taken by the oppressor as violent, like you barely have to do anything. Um, and just like not having um, experienced daily violence, it's just automatically taken as a threat. And I think that like curatorially, that's a really interesting thing to maybe try to weaponize, to use um, violent uh, terminology going forward. Right, well, yeah, and I think it just, it kind of, yeah, it just goes back to that point of like really kind of walking into this weary, you know, it's it's been a very trying, you know, past, you know, however, almost a year now, um, you know, not only in like what we've had to endure, like witnessing out in the world, but like as being a black artist today and having, you know, pretty much every institution scrambling to, to get a piece of you in some way because they, you know, feel the need to, I don't know, like, I guess, prove that they're not out doing bad things, even though that a lot of, a lot of institutions are. Um, you know, but that's, that itself has been like exhausting. Um, and, and so I guess I, like, I, I'm, I kind of like at one point asked myself, like, why do people only listen to me when I talk about my pain? And I'm just, I'm kind of just done talking about that. You know, I've, I've, I've gotten past that, like part of the research. I understand that sort of dynamic fully. And so if I am devoting myself to, you know, sustaining, studying violence and, and image making, um, that yeah, I'm just ready to talk about a different aspect of it. And hopefully people will listen. <laughs> Sora, you, you didn't include this as part of your, you know, images for discussion, but I was thinking a lot about um, that screenshot from the, the students at Arkansas, right, that in the, the sort of like, um, misquoting, but like do the, you know, doing a, a George Floyd, um, you know, to the person. And I wonder, um, right, like, uh, you know, like you exist within academia and I think there's probably a lot of people within this group that sort of exist within the space of academia. And I wonder, like, um, I've tried to follow kind of what Arkansas's response to that has been you know, like knowing you and knowing Brianne, um, sort of trying to like follow what's been going on and, um, you know, like what has been the end result of like Arkansas's, like uh, the president or chancellor's response to that. And then, um, I mean, you talked about uh, just a moment ago, the, the almost like relief of not having to go to campus right to like not have to deal with the like bullshit of like being in this like uh this institution uh and almost being able to live within anonymity through online learning uh i don't know i just i, I wonder like you know how this this has transpired um because it's not been the most publicly um, acknowledged thing and even for people like I've tried to follow kind of what's been going on and it's it's very quiet yeah um, I mean you know I don't I don't know what happened uh, you know with these students um, it's you know probably buried in some you know like it's like in my COVID email folder um, somewhere you know I, I can't remember I've, I've read so many emails um, but um, I think that it's it's important to understand that this isn't the first time this has happened here and like been recorded with an image. I mean, we, there was like, I think 
something like in the 30s 40s 50s something like that where uh, like people would, like do a group of guys in, in blackface and like a yearbook i'm sure the yearbooks are just scattered with blackface um then there was it happened publicly uh with um, the release of the movie black panther student here put himself in blackface um we had this with these piece of shit students um and i'm glad that's recording because i will call them a piece of shit to their face um and then there was also at the same time with this um another student who also publicly posted an image of herself using a skincare mask as blackface um and so you know to me it's like yeah i mean it, it this is a part of the culture apparently like images like this are okay here um because they've continued to happen and, you know, I mean, that I don't remember the response probably alludes to the fact that nothing really happened, you know? Um, and so I think it's, it's just like trying to like, just be as frank as I possibly can in discussing the realities of my lived experience inside of this institution. And I think it's because like, you know, we think about these things that happen and then it creates a situation where then I'm sort of questioning, like, do I want to stay here? When that, I shouldn't even be asking that question of myself at all. I have a right to be here, right? And so what are, what are the things that these institutions are willing, do, willing to do to address the anti-Black and really anti-difference attitudes, values, actions that they hold on to? And my hope is that with everything that we've seen over the past year, that people in positions of power are ready to hold themselves accountable. Because I, I feel like with like the level of, of stuff that's just happening in the world is that we're all tired, we're all frustrated and we're just all like, we're just fed up. And you know, so it's like, if people got to start going to, to start making the actual progress that we want to see, then I think that's about what, like, what's about ready to happen. So I don't know, maybe I'll just, I'll leave that one there. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, like a very honest and good response. <laughs> I want to see if Carlos wants to chime in. I know you have a chat in there. Um, you know, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I wanted to make sure that you have an opportunity to speak if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, it was a really great presentation overall. And uh, one thing that kind of stood out to me uh, in terms of like the span of work that you presented to us and you showed us is that there's a lot of, there's a good variety of like strategies and methods that all these artists we're using and that you yourself use in, in your work as well in terms of uh, reclaiming and reappropriating these these images of violence um, in a way where you know the act itself of violence isn't erased but the gaze is shifted um, and I just think yeah so something like this or another one that also really struck me was the um, the heirlooms um that that gesture those gestures of of violence in terms of just the hanging and the the composition of these these images um the, that's just something that i have had like kind of uh in the back of my mind throughout the whole presentation and i think that's that's something that's really worth mentioning oh yeah thank you so much for sharing um and yeah i mean i i think that i'm actually going to um, stop the share so i can drop some uh links into the chat um since we're kind of getting close to time um but yeah i think just like hearing there's like a clip to the carrie james marshall um work and um just because like the way he talks about it and the vid like the representation on screen just doesn't really do it justice because it's also sort of like this um like he doesn't completely erase the lynching photograph. It's just that it's like really, it's painted or like it's, it's printed um, uh, like, um, like where it's like, an, like an off-white. And so if you kind of stare just blankly at the frame, you'll start to see the actual image come forward. 
Um, and so let me just grab those links. And then I've also just got links to like, you know, everyone's websites, uh, the 1619 project, um, just because I like to, to share um, good work with, with folks. So um, there's a bunch of links for you. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely watch that video um, and, and see Carrie James Marshall talk about the heirlooms and accessories. Because I think for me, that was like when I was doing my thesis research and like really sort of struggling with like, you know, like this this dynamic of, of presenting these images because I didn't fully understand like what it meant to represent an image of violence. Um, but the way he spoke about that work, it was like, oh, like that's when like sort of my artist light, you know, turned on and was like, oh, okay, now I get it. So if I have to have like, I, I not only have to understand the history, but I have to deeply understand what are my intentions with when I sort of make these manipulations on top of this image, what does that intervention provide to a viewer that it, like in like Seely and, and everyone else is talking about, how does it get the viewer to think more deeply? How like, and, and looking past the victim isn't a bad thing. It's just another necessary step with looking at a violent image. Yes, look at the victim, acknowledge that they were once alive, that they were a real person, that they didn't ask to be made martyr, right? Um, you, need to, you need to acknowledge that fully. But then there are lessons to be learned from these things, lessons to be learned about the past, lessons to be learned about today, lessons to be learned, you know, hopefully in a future where these images are just simply reminders of a world we no longer want to have, right? And again, I don't think that's a world that we're gonna see in our lifetime, but maybe with you know, the work that I've made and the, and the research that I've done um, and the research of like all these people and artworks of all these people, maybe someday they will be this catalog of violence that will be sort of a reminder of the place we do not want to return because these are all of the ills that are sort of waiting for us if we, if we backslide to those ways. Um, and I guess, I don't know where we're at on time, but maybe that sounds like a good place to sort of cut it off. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think that's a very, of the many powerful ending notes you've given us, I think that's a, a, a nice one. I just wanna say again, um, thank you so much for, for that wonderful presentation, for, for just being so candid and generous with your thoughts and your time. Um, I'll have, Kate, can, can we take all the links that Zora shared and we'll put them on the Silver Eye um, session four page. So if you come back to our website, if you don't have time to grab these links now, they'll be available for you. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for being a part of this discussion. You know, like I said, this is, this is really something that I just love hearing from so many different voices and, and seeing so many different uh, faces. It's, it's really been, been a nice thing. <laughs> Um, in this in this long quarantine. So again, we'll be back in, in February. Um, and thank you, of course, to Liz and Jillian and Kate and Leo, uh, who are all um, organized all of these sessions, um, and Emily. And um, can I make a quick uh, announcement um, from UB Art Galleries? I also want to announce that this is the, I want to publicly acknowledge the good work of Jillian Daniels, who is our a student curatorial assistant and has been with us, as many of you know, she's the one sending you all the emails reminding you to read this and that. She will be graduating in January and off to do wonderful things out in the world. So I wanted this, this, um, this opportunity to, um, uh, you know, um, to celebrate her publicly. So thank you, Jillian. And thank you very um, much. And, and we, just thank you to everyone. We look forward to having you come back as a civilian <laughs> and join us <laughs> without Absolutely. doing any work. <laughs> so uh, we yeah. look forward yeah, no, to that was, in uh, the new year. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was an extreme pleasure. Thank you everybody for being here. A lot of old friends, a lot of potential new friends hit me up. Um, congratulations, Jillian, on your graduation. Uh, we love you and we hope the best for you. Um, and yeah, everybody have a good, a good night and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>